a reading from the beginning of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening came, and morning followed the first day. Then God said, Let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. And so it happened. God made the dome, and it separated the water above the dome from the water below it. God called the dome the sky. Evening came and morning followed the second day. Then God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered into a single basin so that the dry land may appear. And so it happened. The water under the sky was gathered into its basin and the dry land appeared. God called the dry land the earth and the basin of the water he called the sea. God saw how good it was. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation, every kind of plant that bears seed and every kind of fruit tree on earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. And so it happened. The earth brought forth every kind of plant that bears seed and every kind of fruit tree on earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. God saw how good it was. Evening came and morning followed the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day from night. Let them mark the fixed times, the days, and the years, and serve as luminaries in the dome of the sky to shed light upon the earth. And so it happened. God made the two great lights, the greater one to govern the day and the lesser one to govern the night. And he made the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to shed light upon the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw how good it was. Evening came, and morning followed the fourth day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord be glad in his works. May the Lord be glad in his works. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are great indeed. You are clothed with majesty and glory, robed in light as with a cloak. May the Lord be glad in his works. You fixed the earth upon its foundation, not to be moved forever. With the ocean as a garment you covered it, above the mountains the waters stood. May the Lord be glad in his works. You send forth springs into the water courses that wind among the mountains. Beside them the birds of heaven dwell. From among the branches they send forth their song. May the Lord be glad in his works. How manifold are your works, O Lord! In wisdom you have wrought them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Alleluia. May the Lord be glad in his works. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. After making the crossing to the other side of the sea, Jesus and his disciples came to land at Gennesaret and tied up there. As they were leaving the boat, people immediately recognized him. They scurried about the surrounding country and began to bring in the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Whatever villages or towns or countryside he entered, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch only the tassel on his cloak. And as many as touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
So we began uh, today in the first reading, the beginning of the Bible, the start of the book of Genesis, the account of creation. In the creed, we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. It is our teaching that God created everything that is. God created it all, not just the invisible spiritual realities, but also the visible things, everything we see around us, everything we will ever see or own or touch or possess or smell or feel or hear. God created it all. And this is important because over the centuries there has been this idea that, well, God created the spiritual things, but the devil created the, the, the physical things. No. God is only one creator, and God made everything, and he found it all very good, which is a theme that this passage asserts again and again. God made everything, he made it, and it's good. Anything that's evil is because there's a lack there of the goodness that there should be, or because we misuse it. Evil is a lack. Everything that God makes is good. Now, just because we can misuse something, that doesn't mean that God didn't make it and make it good. And God created freely. He didn't have to. Nobody forced him. because Nobody was there to force him. You can't force God anyway. Nor was there any internal necessity that left him no choice but to create. He would have been perfectly happy forever without creating anything or anyone. He did so freely out of his love. You also see in this passage... Besides the word he made, the verb made, God made, another verb you see frequently in this passage is he said. He's almighty. He creates just by saying something. What is the other verb that appears again and again throughout these uh, 19 verses that we read? The verb separated. Look at how frequently, right from the beginning. He separated things, the light from the darkness, the body of water above the sky from the one below it. He separated the, the, land, the dry land from the seas. He separated the day and the night, the light from the darkness. The word separated comes up again and again. God is the great creator He is, of course, the great unifier. He brings all things together in Christ. He is also the great divider. And if we miss this, we miss a key aspect, not only of what God does, but of what we need to do. He separates light from darkness. God is light. In him there is no darkness. Darkness represents evil, sin, death. God separates in creation the light from the darkness, the day from the night, as a sign of what we must do. He's creating us free, and therefore we can choose either light or darkness. We can choose either God or rebellion from God. We can choose either good or evil. But God has separated the two to make it clear to us that the choice is ours and that we must be on the right side of that separation. God continues throughout salvation history to separate and to divide. We see as he raises up his chosen people and prepares a land for them, that he separates them from the other nations. He makes this so clear to them. He gives them their own land, but he says, look, you're unique. I gave you the covenant. I gave you the law. I gave you the prophets. You know me better than the other nations do. God, in the history of the Old Testament, read it thoroughly, read it carefully, and you see what he's doing is he's making a clear separation between his people and the people who don't know the Lord. He said, do not mingle with the other nations. Do not learn their practices. The fact that that God's people did mingle with them and imitate their practices, especially the killing of children, which in our day is uh, seen in the evil of abortion, besides which there is no greater evil, 
uh, they were punished as a result. That's why the exile happened. But God said clearly that there is to be a separation. And as we, we read through the, the prophets, look at Elijah. He brought the people together and he said, look, there are some who are following the Lord. They are dwindling in number who are acknowledging the true God. There are many others who are following Baal, false gods, demons, in fact, and sacrificing their children to them. And, and as Elijah, at a certain point, gathered the people together and he said, look, how long are you going to straddle the fence? How long are you going to wobble along with two opinions, as one translation says? How long are you going to try to have it both ways? If the Lord is God, well, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. But don't try to have it both ways. Don't say one thing and do the other or wobble back and forth. And he challenged the prophets of Baal. Remember that incident where he said, call on your God and let him send down fire. And nothing happened. And then he called on Yahweh, the true God, and the fire came down. And then he had the false prophet slain. Elijah didn't fool around. And, you know, when people were looking at Jesus in his public ministry and wondering who he was, many said, he is Elijah, come back. Which means Jesus was pretty tough. And he made it clear, didn't he? He said, I haven't come to bring peace, but division. Again, we have to understand this properly. Ultimately, Christ unites all things in himself. But the only way you unite things is by separating. As God did from the very beginning of the Bible, as we read today, the only way you end up uniting is by separating from evil and falsehood and death and sin. Separating good from bad. Unless you know how to separate those, you'll never be united. Because good and evil don't mix. Paul learned this very clearly when he writes to the Corinthians. He says, you can't partake in the table of the Lord in the table of demons. There's got to be a separation. You've got to choose. Jesus said, you follow me, your whole, even your household is going to be divided. Parents against children, mother-in-law and son-in-law and all, there'd be separation within one's own household. Why? Not because Jesus is trying to, to, to tell us to be combative, but because when you affirm good, you have to denounce evil. There's no two ways about it. You have no choice. You don't, you, we have to unite. But that doesn't mean we blur the distinction between light and darkness, good and evil, virtue and sin. You can't blur the distinction. That would be a false unity. If we were to say to everybody, hey, everybody, come on into the church. Everybody's welcome. Well, of course everybody's welcome. The gospel announcement comes, goes out to everybody. But what does that announcement start with? It starts with the word repent. You can't just bring everybody in and say, oh, hey, you, it doesn't matter what you do, what you believe, or who you are. Of course it matters. The reason we want them to come to the church is so they can embrace the truth. Take hold of God's grace, become his sons and daughters, and be saved. That requires a separation from the old way of life. That requires a separation from sin. It's not just, hey, everybody come together. Remember Jesus, he talked about the parable of the wedding feast. Yes, indeed. He said, go out into the highways and the byways and invite everybody you find. Force them to come in. Of course, it's a gospel of universal good news to everybody. But the fact is that when they were coming into that wedding feast, remember Jesus said in the parable, there was somebody there not properly dressed for a wedding and he threw them out. And he said, go out into the outer darkness, there will be gnashing and wailing of teeth. At the last judgment, what did he say in the Sermon on the Mount? We have to be ready. He said, on the last day, some are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, you know, you taught in our streets and we, 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 ate, we ate with you. And he said, I depart from me, I never knew you, you evildoers, get out of my sight. Which he said was going to be the last judgment, as we read in Matthew 25, when all the nations will be gathered before him and he will sit on his royal throne. And what does God say there at that scene of the last judgment? He will separate them. As a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And to those on his right, he will say, come with me into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But to those on his left, depart from you into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We're not making this up. This is scripture. God is the great divider. 
thank God he does that. Because we don't want to unify around some kind of nebulous, uncertain, ever-changing, whatever it is. We want to unify around truth, around goodness, around life, around God. We in America, yes, we know we have a divided nation. And we're praying today... We're using the Mass with the prayers in any need because, boy, have we got a need right now. There are evil policies being implemented that increase the numbers of babies slaughtered in this holocaust of abortion, that ruin our economy, weaken our borders, implement policies that, frankly, deserve the adjective demented, demented policies by the Democrat Party. And brothers and sisters, this is causing, and some people don't realize it, and God have mercy on them, this causes distress for our nation. We need to say it clearly, we need to identify it specifically, and we need to separate those policies and those policy makers that bless us and help us and that uphold the freedom of the church and the law of God and the good of America and the good of our future and our children and our our freedoms, we need to make a clear separation. Now people sometimes are worried about division. Don't be worried about division. Be worried that you're on the right side of that division. That's what we've got to be concerned about. There are so many people in, the, in, the, in, the, in politics and in the church who cry out every day, oh, we need unity, we need unity, and we need unity. And no, 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 the first thing about promoting unity, the first thing about promoting unity, just like the first thing about creating everything like God did here in this book of Genesis, is to separate darkness from light, separate evil from, from good, Know how to separate truth from falsehood and unite around the good and the true and the divine. It is Christ who does this. It is our embrace of Jesus Christ that enables us to do this. And therefore, let me take you back to those first three words of the Bible. In the beginning. Do you know that that means in Christ? And you read at the beginning of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. It says as you read on, all things were created through Him. Apart from Him, nothing came to be. And Paul also repeats this, that everything was created through Him and for Him. Beginning of the Gospel of John, but also the beginning of the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Talks about, is a beautiful hymn, poem there, of Jesus Christ. He is the beginning, Paul says, the firstborn of the dead. He is the head of the church. It's a beautiful passage here that talks about all the different ways that Christ takes preeminence in all creation, in all salvation, in all things. The beginning of the Bible is a prophecy of Christ. All the the Old Testament is. And right, but right from the very first words, literally. Because when Paul writes those opening words in his letter to the Colossians, and he sings that hymn of praise to Christ about him being the firstborn from the dead, the one through whom and for whom all things exist, it's actually a commentary on these first three words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, in Christ who would be the head of the church, the firstborn of the dead, king of kings and lord of lords and judge of all. In Christ, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's why when we embrace him, we have everything. The earth was a formless wasteland. Darkness covered the abyss and a mighty wind swept over the waters. You know what that wind is? The Ruah of God. Breath. Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Ghost, creator blessed, right? He's the Spirit. That's why respiration, breathing, 
Respiration has the word spirit in it. It's the meaning of the word. The spirit hovered over that ancient chaos and disorder and brought about life and light and goodness. So the spirit sent from the Father and the Son was breathed on those apostles at Pentecost to begin a new creation with the forgiveness of sins and the adoption in the Holy Spirit of men and women to be his sons and daughters. That spirit hovers over our world again today to bring order out of chaos. And in this Mass, let us pray that that spirit hover over America to end the darkness of the evil policies that we see in our midst, particularly now being carried out by the Democrat administration in Washington. Enough of this. We must reject policies that are contrary to the law of God. Enough with this being so concerned about, be, about how, why, how divided we are. We have to be divided when policies that are proposed are contrary to truth and to God's law. We have to be divided. And our concern is not that there's division. Our concern is to make sure that every day, every moment, we are on the right side of that division. And the right side of that division is to be with Jesus Christ and to make sure that in everything his law and his truth is applied and followed and that the opposite of it is in fact rejected. Lord God, thank you for creating all things in Christ. Thank you for the privilege of following him and bearing witness to him every day of our lives, in every aspect of our lives, now and forever. Amen.